Hello friends, followers and channel members, welcome to another video here in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. In our video today, we are going to be discussing quite a complicated topic, and that is the world of approach minimums. This basically means working out what kind of approach and landing you are allowed to perform given the current state of your aircraft and the weather at your destination. Now this is not a straightforward or easy topic to understand, so please do bear with me in the video, and if you do have any questions afterwards, please do leave a comment down below and I'll come back and uh, answer those for you. But what this video will address is the question I get asked plenty of times during live streams, and that is, when should I actually perform an auto land, and can I do it all the time? First off, we're going to start by having a look at this runway. So this is runway 06 for Edinburgh, and as you can see at the bottom here, runway 06 has an ILS category 1, category 2, category 3A, and category 3B. Now, many of you will know that because of the category 3 A and B, etc., on this chart, it means that yes, this runway is capable of having you perform an auto land. So, if that is the case, why don't we simply auto land all of the time? Surely that would be safer as it reduces, of course, pilot workload and pilot error. And we know the aircraft is more than capable of performing an auto land very, very safely. So, why wouldn't we just opt to perform an auto land all of the time when the runway is capable of it. Well, before we go any further, we need to get two things very clear in our minds. The first one is, this is the capability of the runway. So yes, the runway is capable of allowing our aircraft to perform an auto land. But that's the capability of the runway. What about the capability of the aircraft itself? Now, under normal circumstances, your Airbus A320 will be fully operational with no failures or anything like that that's going to affect the aircraft's capability to land, meaning your aircraft is also capable of performing a CAT-3 auto land. And you will see this when you arm the approach and pop on both the Autopilot 1 and the Autopilot 2, that on the FMAs on the top right hand side, you will see your aircraft telling you the aircraft is capable of CAT-3 dual. And CAT3 dual is essentially the same as CAT3B. CAT3 single would be the same as CAT3A. So you can see how the two respect each other. Now, this information given to you in the aircraft stating and showing CAT3 dual is only telling you that your aircraft is capable of performing a CAT3 dual landing. And I know a lot of people get confused here because they see CAT3 dual on the primary flight display up here, and they presume that that means that they can go ahead, perform a CAT3 dual auto land on the runway that they are landing on. That might not be the case. This is only telling you the aircraft is capable of performing a CAT3 dual landing. But is the runway capable of performing a CAT3 dual landing? In order to find that out, we need to have a look at the approach chart for the runway that we're going to be landing on. So the runway in the example just shown, we were landing on runway 06 left at Palma de Mallorca. Here is the chart for that, and you can see that this is just a standard ILS. There is no CAT2 minimums, there are no CAT3B minimums of any kind, which means this is essentially just a Category 1 ILS approach. So, does this mean that I cannot perform an auto land here? Well, let's just take a step back even further. If we look down at the bottom, we can see for a Category C aircraft, which the Airbus A320 is, the runway visual range must be a minimum of 650 meters. If the weather at this destination was less than 650 meters, we would not be allowed to start the approach. I am here, of course, looking at assuming our missed approach climb gradient is a minimum of 5%. That's for a different tutorial. But to all intents and purposes, we can presume that our aircraft, the A320neo, with both engines running, will easily be able to meet a minimum climb gradient of 5%. You can see, though, from this chart that if the missed approach climb gradient of other aircraft was a minimum of 4% or even 2.5%, then the runway visual range that is required to legally start this approach jumps right up to 2,000 meters and 2,400 meters, respectfully. You can also see that the runway visual range also increases its minimums if the approach lighting system is unavailable. That's indicated by the box ALS out. 
So to quickly recap what we're looking at at the moment, our aircraft is fully operational and shows Cat 3 dual capability, but the runway we're landing on here only has Cat 1 minimums shown. So now a question. Can we legally perform an auto land? The answer is yes, we can perform an auto land. You can perform an auto land off a CAT 1 approach, but you do have to respect the minimums. You couldn't do it if the runway visual range was below 650 meters for a Category C aircraft like the Airbus A320. And that is because you're not legally allowed to start the approach if the weather is below these minimums. So you can technically do an auto land off CAT 1 minimums, but this is why we don't. First of all, if the runway visual range is more than 650 meters, you've got plenty of time to see those runway lights and perform a manual landing, which always is good for the pilots, keeps the pilots sharp, so they're not always relying on the automation. But more importantly, take a look at this. As you've been taxiing around, you have quite likely seen the holding points before entering the active runway. But have you noticed that at many of the major airports, you will have more than one holding point? And you may even have seen the signs as shown here in this picture that say things like runway 27, category 1, 2, and 3. Now, the instrument landing system is, of course, a very, very sensitive piece of equipment and it is prone to interference from objects. And we don't want anything interfering with the instrument landing system if aircraft are performing auto lands using this system, which is why the instrument landing system itself has something called protected areas. If an aircraft taxes to the visual holding point for a runway, as you can see here in this picture, the protected areas of the ILS system are no longer protected. The aircraft could interfere with the ILS system, which obviously could then interfere with the signals that an aircraft coming into land would be receiving. The protected areas are no longer protected. When the weather is good, these are the holding points that airports will use. If the weather and visibility at the airport is quite poor and the visibility of the runway range is starting to drop below those CAT1 minimums, then the airport might move into using what is called low visibility procedures. And each airport will have its own rules in place for when these low visibility procedures will be activated and put in place. If low visibility procedures at your landing airport are not currently in place, you cannot be guaranteed that the critical areas of the ILS system will be protected because aircraft will not be holding at the category 1, 2, 3, etc. instrument holding points. This is why, even though technically you can perform an auto land off a category 1 runway, pilots don't, unless they have absolute 100% certainty, perhaps from air traffic control, that those protected areas around the ILS system on the ground are indeed protected and safe. So let's move on then to the next part of the video and perhaps look at a scenario where the weather is below the runway visual range allowing us to land with CAT 1 minimums in place. Now, normally anything above a runway visual range of 550 meters is a CAT 1. So let's have a look at a scenario where the runway visual range may drop down to around, let's say, 400 meters. Here are the approach minimums for Edinburgh again, this time runway 24. And as you can see, as before in Edinburgh, we've got CAT 1, CAT 2, CAT 3A, CAT 3 B minimums all given here. CAT 31, as we would expect, is a runway visual range of 550 meters. But in this scenario, as I've just said, we're going to pretend that the runway visual range today is going to be 400 meters. That means that we are not legally allowed to begin an approach using the CAT 1 minimums and a decision altitude of 300 feet. So the next question is, which minimums do we use? We can see from this chart that a runway visual range of 300 meters or above is the CAT 2 minimums. And of course, we can go further than that runway visual range of 200 meters for the CAT 3A and just 75 meters for CAT 3B. Which one do we use? 
Well, in this scenario, as the runway visibility range is quite poor, we can proceed to presume that the runway is operating in low visibility procedures. So all those protected areas of the ILS are indeed protected and the aircraft are being told to hold at the instrument holding points. So if we have got a fully capable aircraft, so an aircraft with no faults, meaning that we can perform a CAT-3 dual auto land, we can go right down to the CAT-3B minimums, that runway visual range of 75 meters, meaning that no decision height is needed for that, or a decision height of less than 50 feet. Now, this is sometimes where some confusion creeps in. Because the runway visual range we're saying is 400 meters, why don't we just go down to the next category? So in this case, category two, because their minimums are a runway visual range of 300 meters. Well, if you've got a fully working aircraft and you know that low visibility procedures are in place and everything's protected around the ILS, then you may as well go right down to the bare minimums because you can, and your aircraft is allowing you to do a CAT-3 dual approach. So you can choose a decision height of below 50 feet and go right down to CAT 3B minimums, which means actually you could just type in no in the radio field of the performance page. So just to summarize this again, because I do know that this is quite complicated stuff. If the runway visual range is below the CAT 1 minimums, 550 meters. So if it was, say, 400 meters as we've used in this example, then if we have a fully working aircraft capable of CAT 3 dual performance, we can drop the approach minimums right down to just 75 meters, which essentially means no decision height and a full auto land. Let's stick with runway 24 then and have a look at another scenario. Let's say we were coming in to Edinburgh and the weather was very poor, which isn't entirely unthinkable in Scotland. Let's say that the runway visibility range was just 100 meters, but we only had one working autopilot. Could we legally begin an approach? The answer is, of course, no. No, we couldn't. If we only had one working autopilot, that is the same as being able to perform a CAT 3A approach. Well, the minimums there for the runway visual range is 200 meters. And I just said previously, in this scenario, our runway visual range was going to be 100 meters. That is below the minimums for a CAT 3A approach. So no, we would have to divert and go and find somewhere else to land with better weather. Finally then, let's try one more scenario. Let's pretend that our aircraft is uh, fine. Both autopilots are working. Um, and the runway visual range now in Edinburgh is, let's say, 250 meters. So obviously, we wouldn't even be considering CAT 1. It's well below those. Um, it's also below CAT 2. But with both autopilots working, we can do a CAT 3 dual approach, which is same as CAT 3B. And we are well above a runway visual range of 75 meters. So we're thinking our runway visual range at the moment in Edinburgh is 250 meters. What happens then if we get a failure of our auto thrust? Well, a failure of the auto thrust automatically downgrades our aircraft's capability to CAT 2. So this means that whilst the runway is obviously capable of accepting a CAT 3A, CAT 3B approach, it's the weather is above those minimums, our aircraft has now got a problem which has reduced its capability down to CAT 2, meaning we can only land with CAT 2 minimums. CAT 2 minimums, as you can see, is a runway visual range of 300 meters, but I've just said for this scenario, our runway visual range was 250 meters. That means we are not allowed to begin the approach because we as an aircraft can only fly using the CAT 2 minimums and so we would have to look at diverting. Finally then, I want to bring your attention to this particular approach chart. And now this is Faro runway 28, uh, a favorite of ours on the, uh, the channel to come and land at. But as you can see from the minimums given down here, 
CAT 1 is a little bit higher than the normal minimums. Remember I said a little bit earlier on in the video that normally CAT 1 runway visual range is 550 meters, but every airport is slightly different. That's not to be taken as standard. And as you can see here, it is actually 750 meters for the CAT 1 approach. So runway visual range has to be above that before you can legally make the, uh, the CAT 1 minimums approach. But CAT 2 minimums are also available here so a runway visual range of 300 meters the interesting thing about this airport is that is the lowest runway visual range that you are allowed to go to if you are coming to land in Faro. anything lower than 300 meters and you would have to divert because the runway has not been signed off as safe for an approach if the visibility is below 300 meters Thank you so much for watching, guys, and I appreciate that this video has been rather intense. There's been a lot of information contained within this video, so please do go back, re-watch the video again if uh, if you want any more clarity on, uh, on what's been discussed. If you still have questions, then please do leave a comment down below, and I'd love to come back and, uh, and help you out, because this is a very complicated topic, uh, and one which I know lots of people ask me about during live streams and uh, on our discord server so please do get in touch if you have any more questions and uh, yeah difficult stuff but thanks so much for watching really do appreciate that give the video a like and do help other people to find the channel and of course if you are brand new to the channel and enjoyed the video then please also do hit subscribe and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss any future videos or live streams thanks very much and i'll see you all again very soon bye bye for now